Hello students and welcome to Home Learning Biology. My name is Mr. Quincy, Mr. C. Once again, I'm inviting all the Form 5s, Form 4s, Form 3s, 2s and 1s to come and observe and listen to what I have to offer today with regards to the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a system of hormones, hormones being chemical substances transmitted through the blood from special organs which are called endocrine organs. And these chemicals are transmitted to target organs, to target places, target organs, where they then give a response. These are hormones we're talking about today. The endocrine system. Like I said, this is a system of hormones. The hormones are produced by special glands in the body, and these glands are called the endocrine glands. They are located in special or in certain regions of the body, like in the head. You can see here the head region where these organs are located. That's the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is an endocrine gland. It's an endocrine gland just like the others. That's an endocrine gland located in the head. Then there is a thyroid gland by the neck, the neck region. The thymus is also an endocrine gland. The pancreas is an endocrine gland. You remember, the pancreas is also important in the digestive system, in digestion, for it produces enzymes. It produces pancreatic juice, which contains enzymes which are helpful in digesting foods like carbohydrates, proteins, fats. But in this particular case, we're looking at the pancreas as an endocrine gland which produces hormones, which will give a particular response of some organs in your body. We then go down and look at the adrenal glands. Adrenal glands. Adrenal gland produces the hormone adrenaline. This one is observed when you're so excited or frightened, then the adrenal gland is activated and it produces the hormone adrenaline. Then you exert the relevant kind of response. We'll look at that in more details. And here, the male, that's the testis. The testis in this case is a gland that produces hormones responsible for the secondary sexual characteristics in boys because testes are found in boys. Then the ovaries in females. In females, yes, testes are found in males, not just boys, but, but males. And the ovaries are found in, are produced by females, and they're responsible for producing this particular hormone here, which exerts some kind of behavioral change, some kind of behavior in the female reproductive system, in the females, behavior in females. What kind of behavior? Female-related behaviors, you know, like menstruation and the like. So it's all a function of the ovaries, the hormones produced by the ovaries. So this is a, a holistic setup which shows all the hormones in one's body. I want you to, to take a few seconds and locate the position of these hormones here. For at the end of the lesson, there'll be an exercise with regards to that. I'll be asking you to state where the pituitary gland is located, the adrenal gland is located, and also the hormones which are produced in those, uh, by those glands. That also is a typical question the examiners would like to you know, enjoy asking you during your final examination. So in a few seconds, as I slide, go down the slide here, note the positioning of these glands and also understand what chemicals or what hormones are produced there. The next slide, students, shows the brain. The brain, which is very complicated for its partition in a number of ways. As you can see here, we have the cerebral hemisphere on the one side. And then there is also the cerebellum, the medulla oblongata. These parts are not interested in right now, like the hypothalamus. Of interest to us 
in this particular lesson is the pituitary gland. This is called the master gland. The pituitary gland is called the master gland for it produces a number of hormones. The hormones produced by other endocrine glands in the rest of the body are also produced by the pituitary gland, which is located at the base of the brain, as you can see here. When you look at the nervous system, we'll discuss the function of the cerebral hemisphere, the cerebellum, the hypothalamus, and the medulla oblongata. These are special areas which most of them deal with reasoning. But for now, we're looking at the pituitary gland that it produces these special chemicals, hormones, which are then transmitted through the blood, carried through the blood to target organs where they then induce response. Having said that, I want us to look at a few notes regarding to what you've just said. That's the pituitary gland. It attached to the base of the brain. Yes, as you can see here, it's at the base of the brain. That is the pituitary gland. It produces many hormones. Produces many hormones. That is, the hormones, once again, produced by the other regions of uh, the body, the other endocrine, the other glands, endocrine glands in the body, are also produced by this master gland, which is the uh, pituitary gland. But of interest to us are two hormones here. Yeah. These ones are the FSH, for the chloral stimulating hormone, and the luteinizing hormone, LH. It's very important to know these two hormones and what they do in the body, you know, what they do in the body. Follicle stimulating hormone. A follicle is part of the ovary in the woman's reproductive system. Ovary in the woman's reproductive system. The ovary in the woman produces the gamete ovum. The gamete ovum, that's singular, ova, that's plural. Not Ovule. Ovules are produced by you know, plants, not animals, not animals. So the ovary here in the woman's reproductive system produces the ovum. This FSH stimulates the outside of this ovum to mature and then produce the hormone estrogen. To mature and then produce the hormone estrogen. So that will imply FSH is only found in females, not males. For males do not have the ovary. This hormone here, luteinizing hormone, induces ovulation. Ovulation, again, is a process that occurs only in females. For it is the release of the ovum, which is the egg. Day 14 of the menstrual cycle. Remember the menstrual cycle from day 1. To day 28, that's the month. From day 1 to 5, that's menstruation. Day 1 to 4 to 5, that's menstruation, depending on the woman's physiological, you know, setup, menstruation. Then on the seventh day, on the 14th day, that is when ovulation occurs. On the 14th day, that's when ovulation occurs. Then on the 28th day, it's the end of the cycle. You start menstruating again. You start from 28, then you start counting 1 to 4 again. That is why you when you use the calendar, the safest area, the most unsafe time to have sexual intercourse is day 14. Because of the ovulation. Because this FSH is very active there, and the LH is very active there, and it's inducing the ovulation. The concentration of LH at day 14 are very high in the woman's body. And as such, there's definitely the release of the ovum. So having sex at that time is really, really a risk. That is, if you don't want to have a, a child. So that's what the pituitary gland does. And the location. As I move down the slide, I want you to look at the location of the gland of interest, the pituitary gland. For the examiner, will ask you, which part is responsible for producing hormones which, you know, control or maintain or monitor uh, the woman's menstrual cycle? They may label that one as A, maybe here B. Then you will know that, no, the pituitary gland is located somewhere at the base of the brain, so it must be the pituitary gland. And the examiner may further ask you, 
give to hormones which are produced by this, you know, part labeled A here. So you must know that is the LH luteinizing hormone and the FSH uh, follicle stimulating hormone. So that is the brain students, and you must be able to identify, you know, to locate this gland, the pituitary gland, which is known as the master gland. Next, we look at this slide here, which is the part of the female reproductive system or the female reproductive organ. Of interest here, again, is the ovary, which we have just talked about. The ovary, which has the follicles, the same follicles which, when they mature, they account for the release of the ovum. They account for the release of the ovum. So where is this ovary located? It's located at the ends of the fallopian tube. At the ends of the fallopian tube, which is also called the oviduct. It's located down there at the end of the oviduct. There you have the ovary. You know, that's the oviduct. That's the area where um, um, the ovum are produced. So once the ovum are produced, the ovum will then, once the ovum is produced, it will go like that and be collected by the funnel of the oviduct. That's called the funnel of the oviduct. This is the funnel of the oviduct. A funnel, like a funnel that is used for, you know, containing water. Collecting water when you transfer it into a beaker in your science uh, uh, session, science practical session. So this is called the funnel of the oviduct, and it collects. This one is not collecting water, but it collects the ovum that will be released there. So the ovum will go in there. So the ovary, in this case, with regards to what we are talking about, the endocrine system, the system of hormones, the ovary will produce hormones. And the hormones produced here is the hormone estrogen. Is the hormone estrogen. Let us look at the notes to clarify what I'm talking about. Ovaries is what we're talking about here. And they produce the ovum or ova. Ovum, that's one plural ova. This produce the hormone estrogen. This produce the hormone estrogen. Ovaries produce the hormone estrogen. So ovaries produce two things. One, they produce the ovum, which is the egg. Two, they produce the hormone estrogen, which does what? Ovary is only found in females. Only females get pregnant. Males do not get pregnant. These hormones are responsible for the maintaining pregnancy. That's in general terms. They maintain pregnancy. Specifically, then, we can say estrogen prepares the uterus for implantation. What is implantation? This is the attaching of the zygote of the embryo on the uterus. That's implantation, to implant. So when you see implantation, always think of the embryo embryo or the zygote for with this implantation the zygote is attached you know along the region of the uh, uterus that's implantation so we're saying the estrogen hormone prepares the uterus for implantation how does it prepare that for implantation to occur the uterus must be ready it must be filled up with blood vessels so that when, when these embryo zygote comes it gets attached and at that point in time there will be a formation of blood vessels from the mother to the embryo which will then develop into umbilical cord and the like placenta in the long run so that's a preparation what preparation again are we talking about the building up of the uterine wall of the uterus that happens after day 14 of the menstrual cycle. We said day 14 is the ovulation time when the ovary is released. So the system, the systems know, the body systems knows that. So day 14, the ovum is released. By chance, there is fertilization, a zygote is formed. Then at that point in time, the uterus must start building up, preparing for a likelihood of implantation in case fertilization has occurred. So hormones are released for such. 
come menstruation day 28, the whole job, the whole task done by the hormone estrogen in preparing for implementation then breaks down in the form of blood, breaks away. The uterine wall breaks and there's a of blood through the, the scene from the vagina. So that is a menstruation. So the whole process will start again. That is why it's called a menstrual cycle. It's a cycle, it keeps going like that, like that, that's a cycle. Also, this hormone is responsible for the development of secondary sexual characteristics. These are characteristics with young boys and girls which show that one is maturing up. One is at the point of changing from being a boy to a man or from being a girl, a young girl, to a lady, to a woman. So that's what I'm talking about here. So with regards to girls, these hormones, estrogen, is responsible for the development of the secondary sexual characteristics, which we shall discuss in a few moments. So let us look at, as I move the slide, let's look at the location of this organ of the ovary, which we said is responsible for the production of the hormone, estrogen, and also it produces what? The ovum for fertilization. That's where it's located. There are two ovaries, one on the left, one on the right. So both of them do the same function, producing the hormones, and both ovaries again produces, uh, produce the ovum. That's where it is. We're not looking at the menstrual cycle today. No, we're not looking at the menstrual cycle, but look, we're looking at uh, the hormones. That is it. The male reproductive organ, the male reproductive system, part of the male reproductive system. So here we're looking at the testes. We're looking at the testes here, and we're saying they produce sperms. We know testes as that producing the sperm. So these are the testes here, producing the sperms. Testes or testicles, producing the sperms. Sperms, which are the male gametes in humans, male gametes, which will then fuse or combine with the female gametes, the, which are the ovum, to form the zygote in fertilization. But we're not looking at that today. We're looking at the testicles producing special hormones. These hormones are called testosterone. Testosterone, it's not difficult to testosterone. It's easy to memorize that for testosterone for, you always name it from the word testes. Testes, testosterone. Testes, testosterone. Ovary, estrogen. Testes, testosterone. That's the hormone produced here. And the hormone is the testosterone and it induces effects in the body of the male. Once again, once produced, is then transmitted by the blood. It's transmitted by the blood and it's carried to target organs where it, you know, gives, it shows, it induces that kind of response. That's the hormone testosterone. And it's located in the testes which are at the bottom, you know, by the, by the, by the penis, urethra. As you can see, those are the these are the testicles where the hormone is produced. Let's see what else is said about this hormone here. Testes. Produce the hormone testosterone, as we said, testis, testosterone, so from the word itself, you, there's no way you can forget that. And also the development of secondary sexual characteristics, that's what this hormone does. Hormone testosterone is responsible for the development of the secondary sexual characteristics in young boys and girls, age between 11 to 17, depending on, you know, varying with individuals. So these are the secondary sexual characteristics. I want us to look at the diagram. Look at this here and identify, locate the position of the testicles. For the examiner, once again, we'll just label this here as A and then ask you what hormone is produced in A and what is the role of that hormone. So you must be able to, to say all that. The tricky part about examiner is that they mix this question. They may talk about um, uh, the hormones and talk about reproduction within the same picture. So here they may ask you for the function of A and then ask you for what is produced at uh, B. B. So A is part of the um, 
you can relate it to the endocrine system, but B is definitely related to the uh, reproductive system. For B, we will produce the semen, but A will produce what? The hormone, testosterone, and the spams, which are the male gametes. So always be positioned for such questions. Next, we compare. I want us to compare now to look at these secondary sexual characteristics we are talking about. And it's important to differentiate between adolescence. Look at the middle of the page. Adolescence and puberty. These are terms that are related, but uh, find a way to define them. Puberty is a time. That's a time, just like uh, the other one. That's a time when the male, when the child, when one, you know, becomes mature. That's age 11 to 14. Puberty is the time at which sex organs become mature. Uh, that's age 11 to 17. That's puberty. So, uh, form one, right? Form one, then definitely you are already in that puberty stage, you know? But uh, once again, it varies with girls, boys, and uh, the way you are, your physiological, you know, set up. Girls get to the stage earlier than boys at the same age. So it varies, you know. The, f the next one, the other one, def the other point of concept is adolescence. The time when a person changes from being a child to being a sexually mature person. That is adolescence. We often talk of adolescent stage, adolescent stage. So that's where we are. That's what I'm talking about. Time when a person changes from being a child to being a sexually mature person. Being a sexually mature person. So we refer to that as, you know, the adolescence uh, stage, adolescent stage. So if one says you are in adolescence, it means you are at that change. Puberty has got that age range. Having said that, now let's get to uh, the comparison between the secondary sexual characteristics in girls and boys. We can see here with girls, the ovaries become fully mature and release the ovum. So you cannot, under normal circumstances, release the ovum before reaching the puberty stage, before being in adolescence. For at that stage, that is when your organs are mature. That is when the hormones you talked about earlier, the FSH and the LH, start becoming active and so induce the release of the ovum. So that happens, you know, at puberty. And this point here is one characteristic you know, for secondary sexual. It's one secondary sexual characteristics. Ovaries become mature and release the ovum. Menstruation. Menstruation, like we said, is the breaking down of the or uterus wall. Uterus wall as a result of fertilization not taking place. So that is menstruation. It's another uh, secondary sexual characteristics for the girls. Development of breasts, yes. Development of breasts. They bulge up, they become bigger. So that should anything happen and you have a baby, then there must be milk produced there. You must be able to breastfeed. So that occurs. If one starts to see the breast developing, then you must know that, yeah, uh, the secondary sexual characteristics now are on course. Development of hips. Yes, the hips start to develop. And yeah, they bulge up. Growth of hair around private parts and under the arms. Growth of hair around private parts and, uh, you know, under the arms. Once you see those you know, showing up, you must know that you are really maturing up now and start taking care, taking good care of yourself. Active uh, sweat glands. That's where the element of, uh, you know, of sprays, roll-ons come in. You should really subscribe to that at the stage. So, yeah, these are the secondary sexual characteristics in girls. There are some characteristics which are shared between the girls and the boys, as you'll see here. Let's look at the boys. Maturing of testes and production of spams. Yes, the spams are produced and the, the test is mature. As the girl produces the ovum, then the boys produce spam. So is that around? So there's no way you can forget that. Always think of a boy on one side, a girl on the other side. Then this one produces that, and the other will produce that, which is related to the other. So take it that way. Broadening of shoulders. Broadening of shoulders. The shoulder broadens up. That's when the boy changes to become a man. Remember adolescence. When we become, we change from being a, a young boy to a man. So one feature is the shoulder broadening up. That's one characteristic. Depending on the voice, yeah. 
the voice breaks. Then you start showing a very deep voice. So you must know that, yeah, this is the time. Now things can start happening. Growth of hair on face, around our private parts, and the armpits. Hair. So that's one is common with both the boys and girls. The hair around the private parts and in some parts of the body. The hair, facial hair, armpits, and private parts. That's the hair as we saw here as well with the girls. Sweat glands become more active. Sweat glands become more active. So once again, this is the time when you start looking at yourself and say, hey, I am now at this level where my shoulders have broadened up, my voice has deepened, and I've begun growing hair in these private parts. Maybe I should stop subscribing to ointments, roll-ons and like, so that I have a good sand, you know. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, with regards to this secondary sexual crisis. For now, I want us to take a short break while preparing ourselves for the next slide in a few seconds. Stay with me. I can't sit. Okay, students, welcome back from the short break. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. We are now looking at the hormone adrenaline. Adrenaline hormone is produced by the endocrine gland called the adrenal gland. Where is the adrenal gland located? The adrenal gland is located at the top of the kidney. You remember we talked about the kidney as that where ultrafiltration, filtration, and reabsorption of glucose, water, ions like serum ions, chloride ions, all that stuff. It happens in the kidney. So now, right on top of the kidney, there is the adrenal gland, which produces a very important hormone, adrenaline. I'm saying it's important, this one is important, not to say the others are not. It's important is that um, when we're in fright, frightened, you know, adrenaline is pumped in. Once the adrenaline flows in your blood, it goes to the muscles, and when it gets there, it induces the muscles to constrict and relax. Constrict and relax. Contract and relax. Contract and relax. That will induce movement. Yes, movement, not movement. So the reason you run at a very high speed when you see a snake, it's because adrenaline is flowing in your body and it's saying, let the muscles contract and relax and let your feet move at a high pace. Then you start running very, 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 very fast. So that's due to the hormone adrenaline, which is produced by the adrenal gland located right at the top of the two kidneys. That's the adrenal gland. This picture here, this one here, this drawing here, this setup here is very important uh, in the sense, to the examiner, in the sense that a number of questions may be asked, yeah. It will combine the, the questions may combine the endocrine system, that's the hormones. They may ask you what hormone is produced by the adrenal gland. One, that's one. Two, they may ask you what happens at the part, in the region labeled B, if this one is A. B, what happens in B? So you must know that in B, being the kidney, there is a filtration, the urea, from the glomerulus being filtered off to the renal capsule and then all the way to the bladder and out through the urethra filtration. And reabsorption, the water from the renal tubule being absorbed, reabsorbed, taken back to the renal artery, to the heart, back to the heart for circulation. So all that happens in part B, which is the kidney. Something we talked about in our previous uh, you know, lecture. So there are so many questions on that regard. You know, when you look at uh, this one here. Further, C. C is the bladder. We know C is the bladder. What liquid? What is found in C? Which liquid is found in C? So it's definitely, if it's the urinary bladder, then definitely urine will be found there. Urine will be found there. So, like I've just said, a drawing of this nature has, you know, a rich source of questions to the examiner. So as you study this one here, 
you must not just concentrate on the endocrine system of the hormones. Link all the systems that revolve around this. Even the blood secretory system. You can see, you can see here the renal vein. You can see the renal vein. So that's part of the blood circulation system. Renal vein uh, joins from, comes from the aorta. If this is the, or not the aorta, but the vena cava. If this is a renal vein, then you can follow, you can follow the route and it will take you to the inferior vena cava, which is a vein. It's a vein. So again, the examiner may ask you a question related to a blood circulation here, like what substances are found in the vena cava? Then you must know that vena cava coming to the kidney here is bringing oxygen, is bringing nutrients, is bringing what? Yes, urea as well. So that it's filtered off and it all goes to waste. Of interest to us, once again, is the hormone adrenaline, which is found at the top of the kidney, which is the adrenal gland. I want us now to look at the effect of the adrenal gland, what it does to us, what it does to the target organs. Remember, we said the hormones are produced by these endocrine glands and they're transmitted by, carried by blood to the target organs. Then the target organs have to respond. The response of the target organs will make you do something, like running away, like shouting, like screaming, like uh, Let's see what the table says with regards to what this uh, adrenaline will do once it gets to the target organs. Yes, target organ. Our first target organ here is the heart. The heart. That's the heart, the target organ. So we are saying there is adrenaline produced by the adrenaline gland. It gets to the heart. What effect? What does it do? To the heart makes the heart beat faster oh yes what an explanation each time your heart beats faster you must know that it has received some adrenaline for whatever reason it's reacting responding to what your brain has decided on some adrenaline has reached the heart and the heart is beating faster it cannot just beat faster without adrenaline. So there must be some reactions. Your body is responding to something, that's why your heart is beating faster. What effect does it have? Okay, without looking at the notes, without looking at the notes, yeah. If the heart beats faster, what is the function of the heart? Function of the heart is to pump blood to all parts of the body. What's the importance of that? Blood is pumped to all parts of the body, and this blood is carrying oxygen, and it's carrying glucose. So it means the heart is taking glucose and oxygen through the blood to all the cells of the body. Next question. What is the significance of oxygen and glucose in those body tissues? Oxygen and glucose are reactants of the process of respiration. Next question. What does respiration produce? Respiration produces a number of products like carbon dioxide and water. But then, of interest to us here is energy. Respiration will produce energy. Let's link all this now. Your heart is pumping fast. Mm, mm, mm. And it's beating fast. It's pumping fast. Respiration is at the end. So the pumping fast of the heart has a positive bearing on the process of respiration in terms of producing energy. Why do you need the energy? That's it now. You need the energy because you want to run away. We are seeing the snake here. Your heart pumps fast. You need energy to run away. That's it. So that's the connection between these things. Let's see what our note says. Biological advantage of the heart beating fast. Sends more glucose and oxygen. Glucose and oxygen to the muscles. I talked about running fast. The muscles are responsible for contracting and relaxing. That continuous contracting and relaxation gives movement. If it's faster, then it's not just movement, but it's a, a moving, movement at a high speed, which is running. So you run, 
because of that. So the response of the heart and the muscles, there's that positive coordination in there. Of interest, again of note, is that the heart beats faster so that more glucose and oxygen is supplied to the muscles. I want to say this again. The heart is beating faster. Let's take this to, to a bit of physics. It's beating faster per unit time. The heart is beating faster per unit time, which means per second it's now supplying uh, those cells with, say, uh, 20 uh, units by volume, when under normal circumstances you're supplying, say, 10. So it's now supplying 20 units of blood per unit, uh, uh, per, per unit time, it means there will be more blood, there will be more glucose, there will be more oxygen supplied to the body cells, and therefore more respiration, more energy produced. So that's the relevance. Another feature, another target organ is the uh, breathing center of the brain. The brain. Adrenaline is released. Then the brain will, rele will receive the adrenaline. What will happen there? Faster and deeper breathing. Wow. We said earlier the brain controls all activities of the body. The brain has got centers that control breathing, that control sight, that control touch, that control hearing, that control everything, everything, everything. So here we're looking at breathing. The centers of the brain that control breathing will do what? Will be activated so it will breathe faster as a result of the adrenaline going, activating the breathing centers of the brain. So you breathe faster. You breathe faster. Let's talk about breathing faster. Breathing faster. Breathing is the inhaling and exhaling. Inhaling air with oxygen. If you inhale air with oxygen, it means more oxygen in, in more carbon dioxide out per unit time. So it means you are supplying more oxygen to the body and finally to the cells per unit time. Oxygen. We're going back. We're getting back to what we said earlier. Oxygen to the cells. Why oxygen? Because the oxygen is a reactant for respiration. What respiration? That will produce energy. Yes. What for? For you to run away because you are seeing that snake. The snake is still approaching. So, breathing center of the brain, where as you see the snake, will be activated. So, to breathe faster, thus throwing in more air, and the oxygen will go to the body cells. Respiration will occur, and then it will produce more energy for you to give the appropriate response. It could be running away, or screaming, shouting or doing whatever, you know, that is relevant. So let's know that. Let's talk about nose now. Increased oxygenation of the blood. Yes, oxygenation of the blood. More oxygen inhaled from the air, more oxygen, then you will get to the blood. Rapid removal of carbon dioxide. Faster breathing is about that, because breathing is just uh, the taking in and out of air. So if that happens at a higher rate, then it means... Uh, there is an uh, increased oxygen to the cells, an increased removal of, removal of carbon dioxide from the cells and out. Next, we look at another effect of the hormone adrenaline at the center, the target organ being the arterial of the skin. The skin, the skin has got veins and arteries, okay? The skin has got veins and arteries. But uh, the adrenaline will affect, will target, will induce some action on the target organ being the arterial of the skin. What, does, what happens uh, on that arterial of the skin? It will constrict, will constrict, meaning it will go deep into the skin. You know, the blood vessels. When it's hot, you know that uh, the blood vessels bulge. You can see your blood vessels bulge in your skin. That's when it's hot. That's called vasodilation. And when it's cold, the blood vessels sink deep into the skin. So I'm saying here, the arterial will constrict, will go deep, sink into the skin as the adrenaline hits uh, the arterial of the skin. Why does it happen? Less blood going to the skin means more is available to the muscles. I said earlier, when it's hot, the blood capillaries, uh, these arterials bulge. You can see them on your skin. The moment you see these blood capillaries, these arteries on the skin, it means there's an increment in blood flow increment in blood flow. But when these are hit by the adrenaline, these arterial sink. They go deep into the skin, that's constricting. Therefore, less blood is going to the skin, the opposite of what I said earlier, which means more available to the muscle. Less blood is going to the skin and more blood 
is taken to the muscles. There is that partitioning, some kind of partitioning with regards to the energies, partitioning with regards to the blood. If the blood should not come to the skin, as seen from the bulged uh, arteries, then it must go somewhere. Where exactly? To the muscles. Blood to the muscles, yes. Feeding the muscles with oxygen, feeding the muscles with nutrients, with, with the glucose. Then there will be respiration. Then you know the function of the muscles. To relax or contract and thus give movement. So there's always the relevant. It's very important to master this so that you can always find a way of tackling a question of this nature. Let's look at the arterioles of the digestive uh, system. Constricts again. Constricts. That is sink deep. Why? Less blood to the system allows more to reach the muscles. So this one is the same as it's similar to what we talked about uh, just up here. Less blood to the skin, less blood to the digestive system. Why? So there, the blood is reserved for the muscles where it will give the oxygen and the glucose for respiration and thus producing energy. So that's how it goes. Muscles and the alimentary canal. Muscles of the alimentary canal is a target organ. What happens there? They relax. How is that of beneficial? Peristalsis and digestion slows down. More energy available for action. Digestion needs energy. It's a process that needs energy. Peristalsis is a process that needs energy. Do you know what peristalsis? The food bolus along the digestive tract. The food bolus along the digestive tract as the intestine. Then the muscle before the food bolus contracts. Mm, and the muscle in front of the food bolus relaxes. And so the food is pushed downwards. I'll talk about that. I'll give you a drawing of that when you do, when you do digestion. That needs energy. So we're saying here, Peristalsis and digestion slows down. It means less energy is deployed to that process. And the rest of the energy is available for action. What action? Running away. We're still seeing the snake there. So all this uh, uh, happen at the same time. All these things happen at the same time. You feel your stomach going like that. You feel your skin shaking or giving the response. Your brain... So it all happens at the same time. So that all the energy is diverted to the muscles. And there you are. You run away from the snake. The muscles of the body as a target organ become tense. The muscles become tense. Mm. Why so? Ready for immediate action. You see a spring in your physics. You take a spring and you compress it like this. When it's, you compress it. At this position, it's ready for, uh, for the action. At this position, it's now tense, ready for you leave. It springs up. So that's what happens here. Yeah. The muscles become tense and ready for action. So that's what uh, uh, adrenaline does. What action? Running away or fighting. Or fighting the snake. You know, if you feel you, you, can, you can fight. If you've got no option you know, of running away, then you have to face it and kick it and fight it. So it's, it's, all, about, uh, it's all about that. The liver. Conversion of liver as a target organ, the conversion of glucose, uh, the conversion of uh, glycogen to glucose, the conversion of glycogen to glucose. Why? The target organ is the liver. And what does the liver do? Converts glycogen to glucose. Why? Because glucose will in turn be used in respiration for the production of energy. Let's see what is being said here. More glucose is available for what we're talking about here. Yeah. More glucose is available in the blood for energy production. There you are. Here is the uh, energy production we've been talking about. The energy production from the glucose. Glycogen is converted to glucose. So the glucose together with oxygen produces energy in respiration. Then we have the, uh, the energy you need to fight what we are seeing there. Metabolic activity to increase. Uh, that's where the energy also uh, is, is, is useful in. Glucose for metabolic energy and the energy which can be used for, for that kind of uh, activity. Look at the fat deposits. 
as a target organ. Conversion of fats to fatty acids. Conversion of fats to fatty acids. Why? Fatty acids are available in blood for muscle contraction. Note that one. Fatty acids are uh, available in blood for, for muscle contraction. Fatty acids are available in blood for muscle contraction. I've always asked myself, why do we need fats? Why do we need fats? You know, fats are related to um, heart-related diseases, you know, uh, emphysema, you know, hypertension and all of that. What exactly, why, why exactly do we consider them a, a, a significant uh, food component? The fats. Look at this one here. These fats are converted to fatty acids. And fatty acids are available in the blood for muscle contraction. So the fats have some role in uh, a muscle contraction. Note that as much as, in as much as we don't want fats in our diets, but look at what they're doing here. Yes, fats are not good. Fats are not good, but uh, they are. Uh, that's what they do here. Uh, reserve a special lecture for the fats because uh, you know there are some varieties of some types of fats which are just out of line. And but again, fats we said we know that they provide energy, more energy than carbohydrates do. So with this table, students, uh, it's very important to know. Uh, what adrenaline does to each target organ, the response given by the target organ as a result of uh, being, you know, activated by the hormone adrenaline, which is produced by the adrenal gland, adrenal gland located at the top of the kidneys, and also the biological advantage. That's the explanation. This part here, biological advantage, this part here, carries more marks because it shows the examiner that you understand what this hormone is all about. So as you study this, you must be able to express it, uh, you know, in your own way as well. Let's go down this table together. The first target organ was the heart. Then you look at the target organ being, the next one being the breathing center of the brain. And then the arterial of the skin and then the arterioles of the digestive system, and then the muscles of the alimentary canal, the muscles of the body, the liver, and the fat deposits. So that's a starting point as you, you know, prepare for a question involving adrenaline. Always think about the target organs and then the effects, then the biological advantage. With that, you will never go wrong. Next, we look at another endocrine gland, this one is the pancreas. Like we said earlier in our introduction for this lesson, the pancreas is that which produces uh, uh, enzymes in the digestive system. It produces all the enzymes, you know, like lipase. It produces pancreatic juice. This pancreatic juice contains the enzymes like lipase, like amylases, like proteases, which digest fats, digest proteins, digest carbohydrates, so you need to know that. But then, related to what I'm talking about today, the pancreas produces two hormones, and these hormones are insulin and the glucagon. These hormones are insulin and glucagon, which are very, very important in here. So that, these are the hormones here, insulin and the glucagon. Hormone 1, hormone 2 insulin and glucagon. They are both related to, you know, controlling the amount, the concentration of glucose in the body. When the amount of glucose is high, is in excess, this excessive amount of glucose has to be converted to glycogen. When the amount of glucose is deficient, when the body is deficient of glucose, then the glycogen has to be reconverted to glucose. This is an element of homeostasis which we shall discuss later on. Homeostasis. So these hormones are produced by the pancreas as you can see here. Hormone insulin and the glucagon being produced here. Here we're looking at the endocrine portion of the pancreas. The islets of Langerhans, that's the part that produces the hormones. It's called the islets of Langerhans, the part of the pancreas producing that. But you don't need to memorize this. You don't have to memorize 
the islets of Langhas. Uh, it's just enough to say the pancreas produces the hormones, the insulin and glucagon. The rest of the part of the pancreas is also not important here. That one is also not. For, your, for our case here, for our you know, syllabus, we may not need to know that. Look at this diagram again. Of interest is some structures which are related, which are part of the digestive system. So this is a composite diagram, composite, uh, composite uh, kind of uh, uh, drawing. The duodenum. Duodenum being the first part of the small intestines, called the diadem, duodenum, then the ileum, then the bile duct from the liver, the bile duct and the liver. Let's call this one A, let's call this one B, the bile duct and the liver. So once again, let's call this one C, once again, the examiner will give you a composite drawing like this one, and from here extract many questions. So as you do your studies, as you do your studies, your revision, you know, always think about all the questions that may be asked in a given situation like this. Don't stereotype yourself like, okay, I'm studying the hormones. I'll only concentrate on uh, insulin glucagon here and forget about urine and stomach and that. Because that's you who has to answer that. And I've, as I've just given you the tip, the examiner will mix up the questions depending or uh, related with reference to what picture, what drawing he or she has given you. I want us to look at our notes here yeah, with regards to this. The pancreas is a digestive gland producing the hormone insulin. Yes, the hormone insulin. It's a digestive gland in the sense that, like I said, it also produces some enzymes, enzymes which we talked about earlier. The lipases, the amylases, the proteases, those are the enzymes. But on top of that, it produces the hormone. That reminds one of the ovary, which we talked about early, early in the lesson, the ovary, which produces the ovum and also produces the hormone estrogen. Wow. So these endocrine glands produce more than one thing. Like, it's like they produce, uh, uh, you know, more than two, sub more than one substance, more than a lot of substances. Also reminds one of the testicles, the testers, which produce the male gamete, the sperm, and also produce which hormone? Testers, testicles. Yes, testosterone. So always think about all that is produced by that particular organ. Now insulin, as we're looking at insulin, what does it do? What does insulin do? It produces... Insulin produces uh, this, uh, it's got an effect on controlling the levels of glucose in the body. Insulin controls the levels of glucose in the body. How? Instructs the liver to convert excess glucose to glycogen. There you are, glycogen. So the insulin converts glucose to glycogen because the glucose is in high amount. It's converted to glycogen. That's insulin. Now, if the body now needs glucose, the body is now deficient of glucose. What will happen? Another hormone is activated. This hormone now comes to play. The hormone glucagon. Glucagon comes to the picture. Glucagon comes to the picture and it will convert the glycogen back to glucose. So we have glucagon, which will convert glycogen back to glucose. So we've got a kind of negative feedback system or a homeostatic activity, which will always maintain the internal environment you know, at that level. Same internal environment, that is homeostasis. If glucose is in excess, is converted to glycogen by what? Hormone insulin. If glucose is lacking, glycogen is converted to glucose by what? Hormone glucagon. Where are these hormones produced? They're produced by the pancreas. What else does the pancreas produce? 
the pancreas produces enzymes like what lipases proteases and amylases which act on what carbohydrates fats proteins so you need to know those things seeing those things out so you don't forget them low levels of insulin production diabetes now if there is less this one is very very important you have low levels of insulin in the body low levels of insulin in the body and we're linking that to diabetes diabetes low level there are many forms of diabetes okay there's type 1 type 2 but we shall talk uh, in this for the sake of this exercise we we'll just generalize low levels of insulin in the body will be diabetic what do you mean by diabetic in general terms you always say there's high sugar content in one's body high sugar content in one's body that is a normal general understanding of a diabetic but diabetic person like i said it goes with type 1 type 2 and all the way up but for us let's just talk about high levels of sugar in the body why there are low levels of insulin in what way if there is less insulin in the body it means there is nothing to convert the excess glucose to lower the levels of glucose and so the level of glucose in the body will be high and so you'll be at the diabetic status that is what is all about so take it from that viewpoint the sugar content oh it's explained here the sugar content in the blood is increased why because your body does not produce enough insulin insulin for what for converting the excess glucose for cutting down the levels of glucose fortunately this the cutting down will change this excess glucose to glycogen which will be stored there so that in the event the body needs the glucose that glycogen stored in the liver and muscles will then be reconverted back to glucose and then glucose for respiration will combine with oxygen then you have the energy for that so always take it understand it from that viewpoint from fives and falls with that i'm saying i mr c mr Quincy, i'm saying have a very very good evening and enjoy the rest of the program especially on social tv i'll see you next time around bye